Uh, good afternoon. This is so exciting. I, uh, my name is Dr. Lynn Shaw, and I want to welcome you to the very first workshop for the Faculty Teaching and Learning Center. So it's really great to have all of you here at the Pacific Coast campus, and I'm so honored and pleased to introduce my friend and colleague, Tom Toe. Thank you. Well, I thank you so much for this opportunity to uh, facilitate this workshop. I was asked, uh, I think I was volunteered by another faculty member to do this, uh, but it has been a good experience. Um, so I'm hoping that the information that will be shared with you today is also helpful. What I'd like to do first of all is that uh, what you have in front of you is really just an excerpt of the uh, presentation today. If any one of you would like to have the whole entire presentation, I'll be happy to email it to you. Uh, let me give you my email address first. It's tto at lbcc.edu. So if you can send me an email, let me know that you might be interested in the presentation, and I'll, sh I'll go ahead and send that over to you uh, electronically. Uh, what I wanted to go ahead and do first is just get you going a little bit. You have in front of you is a yellow sheet that basically asking you to define. Uh, what I'd like to hear from some of you is that your own definition of what underprepared students. Uh, what is your definition of underprepared students? So if you can just take a few minutes, write down just a couple words. It doesn't have to be a full sentences. Uh, describing your own perceptions, your own definition of underprepared students. And we're going to go ahead and put that on the flip chart. And if you have completed, if you can just don't mind, raise your hand and share it with us, and Emily can write it on the flip chart for us, and we'll compare notes at the end. Okay. Uh, well, I have since, but it's so those that like some of the basic skills necessary for success in college. Or don't see the values of it at all. I'm sorry? Or don't see the values of the assessments tests at all. Right. I just said unable to grasp the instruction given due to lacks in experience and or basic skill. It's just a basic skill. So like a call basic.
time management. Time management. Time management. Time management. Skills. Right, yeah. Okay. It's personal lives, but underpinning all this, the one thing you haven't talked about is at the emotional level that they don't think that they can do it. And, uh, so they need to be empowered saying, hey, you can do it. This deep level of insecurity and they already told them so they're going to fail. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. Um, we'll go back to this list later and see how closely aligned are we with your presentation. I wanted to do this because I, I wanted to come from a perspective as a presenter of looking at underprepared students beyond the skills level. So everything that you have shared with us today is really beyond the cognitive level of underprepared students. Because we know in order for students to be successful, there are other non-cognitive factors that have to be considered. So what I did was, first of all, I wanted to give you some statistical data uh, according to the Legislative Analyst Office, this is 2006-2007 data as far as system-wide. Okay. Over 600,000 students were placed into basic skills level. And break down to it by as far as demographic genders, you notice 40% is Latino, 20% white, 20% Asian, 10% African American, 10% not self-identified or self-reported. Now, if you look at Long Beach City College student population, within the last three years, we have been hearing that our students coming in is about 80% to 85% underprepared. Okay. And less than 35% of our students coming in has the necessary skills to be successful at the college level language class. And then less than 20% is capable of handling a college level math class. And this is coming from the Deming report that was presented, got the data from our own MIS office. So what are those characteristics or definitions of underprepared students? If we take a look at how we want to define our underprepared students, there is really no one simple definition of underprepared students, as you can see from our list right here. Okay? But the most common one is, of course, underprepared students basically are defined as lack of skills in, like Jorge had mentioned, reading, writing, and math. Simple. But I also found another definition that I find is so useful for us, and we already touched upon it, is that these are the students who really lack the general knowledge I call it the foundation knowledge for subject matters, and then inefficient skills, which could be a wide range from study skills, time management skills, self-management skills, life management skills. All those come into place, and of course, the very unrealistic beliefs of what college is about, okay. as well as their classes. Just give me 12 units. We hear it all the time in the counseling office. Have you taken the assessment test? No, just give me 12 units. Okay. So those are some of the simple questions that are constantly being raised in our office. Now, if we look at the characteristics of our underprepared students, this is something that's so interesting to me when I was doing the lit review this past weekend is that I didn't realize that underprepared students is just as diverse as our community college student population. This is something I want you to remember as well, that if you ask your colleague who is teaching at a four-year university right now, and ask that colleague to look at their characteristic of their underprepared students, it might be completely different than ours. In which way? Is that if you look at our population, we have older population, we have first-generation college students, we have returning adults, we have multiple facets or 
of different types of individual students. So it's diverse in social economic status, placement test or standardized testing, um, emotional level and health level. Okay. Um, and if you look at the breakdown as far as proportion of underprepared students, okay, a greater proportion over the age of 24, female, and share some of the very common characteristics of what we call the non-cognitive characteristics of first generation and minority students. Non-cognitive? Non-cognitive characteristic is taken into consideration beyond the learning ability or cognitive development. Yeah. So culture factor, all that comes into it. something non-cognitive right <laughs> <laughs> All right, go cool. Okay. <laughs> and then Evidence also supports that underprepared students have a difficulty of connecting with the college environment. Okay. So that's, that's just something that we wanted to consider. Lack of goals, lack of ac academic directions. So, now, before we get into the strategies of handling or how to assist underprepared students, what I wanted to do is I wanted to provide you with some development and theoretical framework as far as understanding students in general. First one is from, of course, the work of Eric Erickson. Many of us are familiar with Erickson's work. Development occurred in stages. Okay. One experience in one stage of development will have a tremendous impact on bringing development to the next level, which is the next stage of development. Okay. This one is in more specifically to student development is working on the work of Erickson. Perry identified the stages of development for college students. More so, when you look at underprepared students, this is actually more applicable to underprepared students, but it can be used for the student population in general. The first stage of development that Perry identifies what we call the dualism. The right versus the wrong black or white, there's no shade of gray in between. Spoon fed me the information as your students sit in the classroom. Don't tell me anything else, any, anything else that I don't need to know. Tell me what's on the quiz. Okay? Don't encourage me to think outside of the box. Okay? That's the first stage of development for many, many college students. The second stage is that if a student's able to work through the dualism stage, then the students will go on to what we call the multiplicity stage of development. This is when uncertainty will come into place. This is when students begin to ask questions. Unfortunately for our students, most of the time they ask their peers. Whether or not they get the right answer or not, we don't know. But the multiplicity is that's when the sense of uncertainty, uh, non-authorities opinion will come into place, and this is what I call the first sign of analytical thinking, because students can start questioning about the information presented to them. The third stage is what we call relativism. This is when knowledge as contextual, certain opinion can have little values. This is when students will say, okay, I can agree with you, but I'm disagreeing with you on other things. So that's when it comes into place. The last one is really committed to it. And learning uh, takes place at each stage of this development, according to Perry. If a student cannot make it through the dualism stage, he or she will have a harder time in certain subject matters that require critical thinking. We as faculty always try to teach our students to develop the critical thinking skills. Okay? We present you with the information, but we want you to take that information beyond that and apply it to your learning process. Okay. Perry is concerned that if they don't make it through stage one, it will be very difficult for the students to reach stage four of development. Okay. The next one is what the constructivist theory. This one, I truly believe that student learners are very multi-dimensional, complex. Okay. 
and only through active experience that the students can learn and make it more meaningful and connected with the student's experience and his or her academic life here at Long Beach City College or wherever he or she is at. We want the student to take ownership of the information being presented to the students. It's more of a center learner approach. Um, students will need to work with faculty one on one <coughs> instead of, again, resist to that dualism stage which is spoon feed me the information. We don't want students to do that. Okay. If we move on, these are the issues. So we hear about theoretical framework from learning and development framework to understanding individual students. Now what we want to do is take a look at some of these specific issues and barriers for underprepared students. Already, you see it on the flip chart. Okay. The number one is really inadequate information. Knowledge in certain areas beyond reading, writing, and math. Okay. Lack of the frame of reference of what is college, what is expected from a student at a college level. Okay. Time management, what is that? <laughs> I need to spend two hours, three hours per unit? What is that? Especially for underprepared students who have never been presented with that frame of reference. That this is college. This is college environment. This is what college is expected out of you. If no one ever taught our underprepared students that, how would they know? And if they go into classes like Political Science 1 without that frame of reference, then the student will continue to set himself or herself up for failure. Number four, unrealistic expectation about classes and certain uncertain major. I joked with you earlier about giving me 12 units. Every semester in the counseling department, we all hear it. Students will come in without having been assessed, without having any kind of a high school transcript that we can review for the students, and just wanted to take a full-time load. Well, trying to explain to those students, especially those underprepared students that know 12 units can be very heavy, can be very challenging, they will not listen to you. Okay, so, and then give me classes that will go toward my major. What is your major? What do you like to study? There's no such thing as major at a community college. As we call it the field of concentration of the program of study. I don't know. I just want to study something. Okay? We can help you with that, but it will take us some time, not during your first semester. Okay? Self-consciousness, low self-esteem, Inadequate motivation, we find that very common among underprepared students. Okay. The feeling of isolation, the feeling of not being mattered, uh, coming to college once again, because if you don't come to college with a frame of reference, what the college environment is like, you will feel very isolated. Okay. Um, lack of knowledge and awareness to plan ahead. It's not because underprepared students don't care about planning ahead, just they're not aware of the fact that planning ahead can help them be very successful here at college. Okay. Not paying attention to important deadlines like registration. Time and time again, you will see students keep waiting and waiting and waiting before they register for classes. Okay. And they still expect for counselor to register for classes or a faculty to tell them what classes they need to take without taking the initiative of finding out what those requirements are. Okay. The last one I wanted to kind of highlight for today is the feeling of being disconnected from the campus environment. Based on the research that I've looked at over this past week or so, engagement is the number one strategy or the number one issue that we need to look at as far as how to work with underprepared students. So the next part I wanted to go over with you, now that we identify learning and development framework to understand students' population in general, we also take a look at definition of what those underprepared students, the characteristics of some of our underprepared students, what I wanted to do is I want to give you some theoretical framework 
That way you can incorporate it into your daily operations as, how, as far as how you can handle or assist underprepared students. First, I want to take a look at the person environment theories. Okay? And if you look at this one right now, basically what it is is that I think most of us are aware of the fact that the more connected you are with the environment that you are in, the better you will be. Well, that's great to say that, but if I come up to a math instructor and say, well, you need to encourage your students to be more engageful in what you're doing and engageful in your classes, the math instructor says, say, that's your counselor perspective, <laughs> okay? What I wanted to do is I wanted to give you information as far as there are actually theories out there that document the successful of student engagement and, this, and the lack of awareness of college students of what they need to do to be involved with his or her environment. So the first one is really the old one, 1936, Craig Lewin, is that the student's behavior is really a function. Okay? Their behavior is a function of the interaction between that student and his or her environment. The next one is really from Alexander Ashton, which is the famous guru from UCLA. It's called the theory of involvement. What Alexander Ashton is saying that based on his research and based on his survey and interviews of college students is that when students are more connected, they are more involved with their faculty members, they're more involved with student services, student organizations, they actually can be very successful and they actually have that level of commitment to their college experience. Vincent Tinto, which is really the theory of departure, what Tinto is saying is that if you create an institutional environment that students can feel inclusive, that students will have that campus environment that they can understand their purpose of being there, that will foster a greater chance of student success. That's the person environment theories. If we look at psychosocial and student development theories, Arthur Chickering, which is my favorite person, who talks about the stages of development in vectors. Okay? What Chickering is saying is that when the college students come in, regardless if it's the underprepared students or prepared college level readiness students, students sometimes don't have the competencies to be successful. It could be a lack of competency in academic, intellectual, physical, emotional, interpersonal. So what he does was he presented a framework with eight different vectors that college students move through in his or her college experience. Okay. That's what he would suggest it for, or he made several recommendations for institution to take a look at as far as how you can change your program, do some program planning that can help students move from one vector to another. Okay. What we want to do is really helping students to go through vector number one, which is developing the competency. But eventually, is go up to the vector of developing a purpose. We want our students to leave Long Beach City College with a more purposeful and meaningful experience, have a more clear goal of where the students will be, whether or not the student wants to transfer, finish an associate degree, certificate. Okay. So, stages of development according to Chickering. More student development theories. This is something that is so applicable for underprepared students. This is the students of what we call challenge and support. Okay. Nevitt Sanford basically stating that there has to be a balance between challenge and support in order for learning to go into effect. College students come in, most of our students will feel very challenged. Okay. It's new. And if they don't get the necessary support, what's going to happen is that learning will never take place. The flip side to that is that Sanford is also saying if you create an environment that's too comfortable for the students, learning will also take place on that. Students will feel stagnant and they're not going to create any kind of learning opportunities out of it. Okay. Transition, this is what we call the theory of marginal and mattering. This is very applicable for adult students. Okay. Is that when you go through a transition process, Nancy Schlotzberg along with Arthur Chickering is stating that when you go through a transition process, you create a sense of not fitting in, you feel marginalized, 
So if you want the students to be, feel engaged and feel connected with the college environment or campus environment, or even to your classroom environment, you need to make the students feel like they are not marginalized and they feel like their opinion that they are matter. They're sitting there in the chair in your classroom, you ought to make them feel like they belong there. Now, it's easier for me to stand up here and say, because I have a class starting next Friday, I have 50 people on the waiting list. Okay. How am I going to be able to do that my first day of making sure my students feel like they matter? It's difficult, but is it impossible? No. Okay. So I just want you to have a foundation that when you take back to your classroom environment or the program that you're working with, that you can try to keep some of this thing in mind and try to incorporate it into your classroom techniques, your teaching pedagogy, or your program services. Okay. Laura Randone, this is Educating Majority. Laura Randone basically says that when students feel validated by the campus community, okay, um, they can develop their self-worth and they can achieve higher level of academic experience. So those are the theoretical foundation that I am hoping that you can incorporate into your work that will give you more of a tool to address the needs or to assist underprepared students. Now, what about the strategies? The specific strategies working with underprepared students. Now, we had a document that was presented here, at the, uh, was compiled together, and I thank those of you who had an opportunity to participate in this. This was a document that was generated by a group of faculty in 1987, here at Long Beach City College. And it's basically, say, working with underprepared students. And I had a chance to look through it. Unfortunately, it was presented to me yesterday, so I didn't get a chance to incorporate it <laughs> yeah. in my PowerPoint presentation. But I looked through it, and it has some very simple strategies that I think any of us can take back into the classroom and make sure that we can address the needs of underprepared students. It starts out with the syllabus, how simple your syllabus should be. Okay? And it's also suggesting for you to do what we call an informal diagnostic of underprepared students. I don't know if I agree with that. Okay? Remember, this information was presented back in 1987. Some of those informal diagnostic techniques is by looking at attendance pattern, whether or not underprepared students come to class regular, or excessive absences, expressions and body language. Again, I don't know if I want to go too much into that, uh, but the document is here. And if you want to take a look at this, I will make sure that it's in our library or the Student Success Committee will have. have library. We do. Be there. Yeah. And I believe there are several copies at the library, both here as well as at LSU. They are very yeah. 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 Okay. Now, for me, what I wanted to do is that if you compile a list of strategies or effective strategies of working with underprepared students or assisting underprepared students, you're going to have a wide list. Of strategies. What I did was I just wanted to highlight some of the most effective strategies that we know is working at Long Beach City College as well as something else that we should consider. One of those strategies is the learning communities. We have some learning communities, STAR, Student Teacher Achieving Results. That is the only learning community that started out here at PCC and it's really focusing on underprepared students. Those of you who don't know much about STAR, it link courses like English 801A with Reading 881, a counseling class, and then a counseling class for college study techniques specifically. Okay. FYE, first year experience, this is more focusing on for students on a transfer track. Okay. It also linked an English class with a counseling class and with the math class as well, and a Learn 11 class, which is what we call student success class here at Long Beach City College. Okay. Puente, is another learning community linking English class with counseling class and so on and so, so forth. And our newest one is Sankofa, which is, has a very specific theme. There are different models of learning communities. 
and there are plenty of research on learning communities that you can look at. But what's so effective about learning communities as far as working with underprepared students are the following reasons. What we do is in learning community structure is that we take a very large chunk of faculty members, a large chunk of students, and we link them together and we structure it down into a cohort structure. So it's more of a manageable unit. Okay? The beauty about learning community as well is the curriculum. It's very structured for a learning community. It's usually, it's usually shared structure or integrated with between subject and context, depending on the theme of the learning community or the student population of that learning community. Students have a greater chance to establish what we call academic social support networks. Because if, if you look back at the characteristics of underprepared students, that underprepared students they don't feel connected with the campus environment. Okay? So when you have underprepared students that are participating in the learning community, it will enable those students more of a supportive environment for those students to reach out and feel connected with the campus environment, as well as working with faculty or instructors. Okay? Students are provided with setting to define expectations of college life through classes like Learn 11, through classes like orientation class, classes like Counseling 49, which is the college study techniques. And this, to me, is an important piece, I think is the most important piece of learning communities, or with any campus community, okay, is really for faculty to work with the advising side, or what we call the counseling side, to provide what we call direct intervention. I call it intrusive counseling. I call it proactive intervention. So that way we can have an early warning system of students who are not doing well in the classes. So for example, if you're teaching a class right now and you want for a counselor or anyone in my department to come in and talk to you about counseling services to your students, we can do that. We can also help you identify students who have been taken, who have took the placement test already, or we can run a list of students who have not taken the placement test already. Okay? Because that is one way for us to work together. I call it the integration. It's being taught at the state level, the chancellor level, state academic senate level. It's called integration of academic services with student support services. It's very simple, but for some reason, here at our college, it's more challenging to get that up and running. Okay. Let me ask a question about what you said. I had I never really thought about that in terms of getting a list of students that have taken a placement in my class for the first mm -hmm. time. Uh, how would we go about doing that again? If you would like for start with a counselor, okay, and you can ask a counselor to go into your class to do some quick uh, overview about counseling services, but you can also ask a counselor to find out whether the, your students have been assessed. Okay. Because then it could help you to change your curriculum if you need to do that, change some of your uh, part of your syllabus if you need to do that. But it's the bottom line is that we wanted to make sure that students, if they have not taken the assessment test, they need to do so. And if they have taken the assessment test, then we want to find out what levels they are at. Okay. So we can help you with that. You can also contact the assessment center to do that as well. Uh, but anytime, if you want one of us to help you with that, we can do that. Here on this campus, we already started that process. We started last semester with human services. Don Watson has been inviting us to come into his class to really talk about counseling services and then go right into the fact, the uh, important part of being assessed for students. Uh, take the assessment test so that way they can get going with other classes. Because we know right now, the majority of our certificate programs are not required for students to take reading, writing, and math courses. Okay? So the way that we can encourage those students to take the assessment test is really introduce to them the purpose of the assessment test, why they should take it, and how it's going to help them in the future for any kind of licensing process, any kind of application, employment application process, any kind of scholarship application process, any kind of transfer application process. So all of those will come into place. Yes? So can students get 
get um, or complete a certificate program with never taking the assessment? That is yes. correct. It has. As of right now, as of right now, yes. So, um, the last thing I wanted to go over is really about learning community, which is one of the effective strategies, is really foster a greater chance for student engagement. Again, student engagement with the campus community. Okay. Other strategies I wanted to also go over with you. Okay. This is from a policies perspective, and I want all of you to be aware of what the Student Success Committee has been doing and what we've been proposed and what we're hoping that it will go into place. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, based on research information, one of the main strategies that, to assist underprepared students is to impose mandatory assessment. Mandatory assessment coincide with mandatory orientation. So what that means is that all new students, with the exception for those who are exempt, have to go through an assessment process. After the assessment, the students then will go through an orientation. Okay. Uh, certain colleges right now, you will see that the college is actually mandating for new students to take a college success level class, or what we call self-management skills or orientation to college class early part of their college career. Okay? Um, those of you who are familiar with Cal State Long Beach, Bob Maxson did exactly that when he came on board. He mandated University 100 for many, many students at Cal State Long Beach. And we can see the result from that right now. This one right now has already been proposed. And believe it or not, it's already in our local regulations. We just haven't implemented yet as the district. So I am hoping that after you hear this, you can continue to go out there and advocate for the Student Success Committee, as well as those of us who truly believe that mandatory assessment testing or placement testing will help the students. It's not going to hinder the students. It will help the students. Okay. Number two, this is also part of the Student Success Plan and it's already been implemented statewide at many of the community colleges, it's really to come up with a list of defined courses of what does it take for the students, what types of skills level that the students will need in order to be successful in those courses. And it could be a wide range of social science courses, English classes, reading, math courses, but it could also be part of our vocational programs. Because we know right now, in certain of our vocational programs, students will still need to do the basic math calculation if they want to learn how to do cost estimating in carpentry. That's just the bottom line. But if we don't mandate assessment testing or have a list of courses that basically say to the students, look, you need some pre-algebra level. You need some pre-algebra skills before you can come into my class and expect for to be successful in the class. If you want to learn how to do cost estimating, you've got to learn how to do math. That's just the bottom line. So I'm hoping that in the future, soon, that we can go ahead and do that as the district. Number three, I already highlighted this, but I wanted to tell you why I put this in here. I was part of the STAR program, which is the Learning Communities program here at Long Beach City College. And I, I can only speak to you from personal experience. Okay? In our STAR Learning Community program, we have students who are all over the place. Traditional college students, 18, coming out of high school, barely passed the KC. We have a returning adults, anywhere between 49 to 55. We have students who's been incarcerated. We have students who are going through multiple uh, levels of development, um, learning disability, um, physical disability. So what I found out in my experience, and I want to share this with you from my own experience, is that when we have consistent counselor that a faculty member can work with, that together we can sit down and we can help the students not only with their skills 
the cognitive skills, but their non-cognitive characteristics that I was mentioned about earlier, then we truly can help and devise a plan to help those students. And that's why learning community is such a manageable structure unit. It's very costly to operate learning communities, but it is such an effective and proven model that when we incorporate something like this into it, it will help the students in general. So what are we doing about this? As from a district perspective, the Student Success Committee, as well as incorporate into the Student Success Plan, we are working on an early warning system. So what that means is that in the future, all of us who are teaching classes will have an opportunity to participate in the early warning system. What that means is that if Seth is teaching a class and he realizes that there are a couple students that might not be showing up in a week or two, he can send those student information over to a counselor or over to a success center and that will be follow up and the students will have an opportunity to sit down and talk with the counselor and, find, and the counselor can explore with that student exactly what is the emotional level, is there health issues here, is there a lack of preparations, a lack of foundation knowledge to be successful in such class, we can figure all that out through the early warning system. Okay. This last one is the important instructional support services, like the success centers. Okay. I know some of you, I, I should say, I know that there are faculty members here at the college who have mixed feelings about the success, success centers. Okay. If you haven't had a chance to participate or go through the success centers, please do so. Have your students visit the success centers. Because right now, I can tell you, again, not according to Tom, but based on all the information that I've gotten, okay, it's basically telling us as a district that we need to come up with intentionally designed activities. We need to come up with specialized support services, such as the success centers, that can help our individual students, but more specifically so our underprepared students. Okay? Because through SI, supplemental instructions, uh, to tutoring, through break it down to the level where, once again, the students will feel engaged with the subject, okay? engaged with the environment. And that could also be led by a peer tutor, which is another student or a graduate student that can tell students that frame of reference or educate the students the frame of reference so that way our underprepared students can be more prepared. Yes, Lynn. What's the status of SI and all those learning communities right now? Are they in existence? Are they under danger of ending? Have they ended? What, what's the status? I believe the Student Success Committee have broken into subgroups, and there is a subgroup that's working on learning communities right now, rebuilding learning communities. Uh, we had learning communities here at our, our district, but it was, it was pretty much not a, a cohesive model. Uh, so that's the reason why that subgroup or the work group is looking at right now that will also address the leader, the issue of SI supplemental instruction as well as SI leaders. Yes. So are, is there SI right now? Is there supplemental instruction? Lee, can you answer the speech analysis is in my area. Uh, right now it's funded primarily through the Title V grant which runs out next year. Right now we have another year so we are in dire need of you know, additional funding for the SI program as part of the plan, as you can see, is to institutionalize SI. Uh, that, to this point, has not happened. So we're still hoping that that happens and looking at other avenues of funding for SI. So we won't have to rely on the grant year after year. Do people know what SI is? Could you just give a little, like, two sentence thing, what it is? Uh, supplemental instruction is basically there's what we call an SI leader. Let's say, for example, this were a math class. We hire students that have been successful in that class and receiving a rate of A, and they hold separate study sessions, so to speak, uh, twice a week to help supplement what the instructor has gone over in class. And the SI leader meets with the instructor so they have an idea of what the important points are, and they use collaborative learning techniques in those smaller group sessions during the week. And it's been shown to be very effective in terms of the students' overall grades, those that participate in SI versus those that don't participate in SI, the grades are just, you know, there's an enormous difference between the two. And so uh, it's a very, very successful program at the institution. 
Because remember, it's, it's, it's the student-led, but it's also created an environment where, again, it's like peer tutoring. Okay. It's more than that. So if I may ask you a question, Lee, SI, can we also incorporate into the vocational areas? Because I know right yes. now we don't have many SI in the past for our vocational areas at all here at PCC. And the answer is yes. Okay. Short answer. Okay. <laughs> we just need to be advocate for it and then right. get funding for it. Thank you. So that's from a program policy perspective. Now, from instructional and curricular strategies as far as assisting underprepared students, okay, teaching based on this book that I found, and by the way, it's very helpful. Um, it's called Teaching Unprepared Students. And again, I think the majority of us already know about this, is that teaching development to, developmental classes, I should say, should be in the context of subject matter. Basically what that is, is trying to link the subject to what the student is preparing. Okay? One of the examples that was cited was, for example, a reading class, not here at Long Beach City College. It was cited at, um, I think it was at uh, Paradise Valley Community College, that developmental reading classes, they're only being taught the students are only being taught the process of reading and not so much related to the context of, this, of the student's environment is concerned. So learning will need to take place when context and subject matter are linked together. So make it meaningful for the students. It will foster the environment for learning, especially for underprepared students. Okay. Collaborative learning and experiential strategies. It's already been mentioned just now. Collaborative learning, group work, giving students a chance to work together, give a chance to, for the, the students to create something more meaningful. Um, experiential strategies, it will create a learning learner-centered environment uh, that will also foster student learning. A couple semester ago, I believe it was two years ago, I was hoping she'd be here so she can talk more about it. Janae Hun, who is a, one of our sociology instructors. When I found this out, I was so excited about what she's doing in her class. She was teaching a class, Sociology One, Introduction to Sociology. Part of her project was that instead of, she's linking against subject matter with context. Her project or her research project for her students is to pick an area where they are living and do a research on how many liquor licenses are there in those areas. <laughs> Okay, so when the data came back in her class, basically what the students share is that it depends on your zip code. Certain zip code will have more liquor license or more liquor stores in a corner versus other area in a certain part of the city. So by doing that, she gave the students an opportunity to really take the subject matter and connect it with their own living environment. Okay? And make it so meaningful for the students that they actually grow in that class and learn in that class as far as what sociology is about. So that's just a perfect example I wanted to kind of highlight because I really like Janae and I really like her teaching style. Okay? The last one is really faculty and peer mentoring. Okay? We already hear that if a students feel more comfortable with certain faculty member. The faculty can serve as faculty mentor and peer mentor. And it's, again, give the chance for students to be engaged, give a chance to, for the students to take that proactive approach, and then give a chance for the opportunity for faculty-students relationship in an instructional way, not in any other way, and then for student-student contact. Okay. So we already know that when you want to learn something, by teaching others what you learn, you actually can learn more about the subject. So basically, that is really pretty much of the information I wanted to present to you today. Okay. Um, I wanted to kind of finish out this presentation by giving you my own personal experience. I was an underprepared student. I came to America when I was 13, uh, after the fall of Saigon. 
My father was in the military, uh, working for the CIA, so we were on the hit list, so we had to leave two days before the fall of Saigon. I arrived here in America, uh, I was immersed into an ESL program, um, really did not feel like uh, I was belonging at my high school. Um, for English instructor was telling me that I could never learn English appropriately. I still not have not mastered the language. Um, English is my second language, so that I, I just wanted to, to always tell students that you can learn every day. Language is, is, a, is a powerful tool. So I arrived at University of Colorado at that time, back in 1991. There were not many Asian students there at University of Colorado. So talking about the feeling of marginalized. Uh, I took the placement test. I was placed into what we call basic skills at that time, or remedial courses at that time. So mainly it was focused on skills, skills, skills. But no one ever helped me to understand the frame of reference of what a university environment is about. The frame of reference of what professor is expected out of you. Just because you're sitting in their class and they have a call on you, that doesn't mean they don't care about you. Okay, so working on my way up as an underprepared student, I truly can appreciate everything that certain professors or certain instructors can do in his or her classes. So when I was asked to do this workshop, I volunteered by somebody else. Um, I said, okay. I wanted to kind of gather as much research information as possible and to provide you with the information. So what do I learn from this? Is that I truly believe that as faculty member, we can make a huge difference in our individual student's life if we can just take a few minutes to understand, the un to really look at from a theoretical perspective as well as from a de developmental perspective, who are our students? Okay. Why are they in our classes? And our teaching pedagogy, can it be enhanced by the lack of understanding or by the knowledge that we know of our students um, as we go on from day to day with our lecture? Okay. Can we change things up a little bit to incorporate more collaborative learning, to incorporate more experiential strategies into our classrooms? I know it's harder for certain subjects. Social sciences might not be an issue, but when it comes down to natural sciences and math, that is a bigger challenge. Okay? But it can be done, uh, because one of my greatest mentors at the University of Colorado was a math professor. So, uh, but thank you for your time, and if you have any questions, and all these are my books. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all so much for coming. We did pass around an evaluation. Just fill it out, please, and leave it on the desk. And make sure you sign in so that we can give you your one hour flex credit. And thank you all so much for coming to the first workshop for the faculty teaching and learning. Center. Oh, by the way, I wanted to point out to you one more thing. I did make a mistake, okay? I did this purposely. Our logo right now, our logo right now is to educate, engage, and empower. My philosophy with working with underprepared students is that you got to get them engaged first before you can educate them. And once you educate them, then you can empower them. Okay? So I, did, I just wanted to point that out because sometimes people will say, well, that's an error. Thank you very much.